Last session, we stopped here with domain adaptation. Uh, the concept of domain adaptation and the next few topics that I'm going to go through, like few shot learning and federated learning and self-supervised type of learning. These are the type of topics that are really important when you want to take a research idea and turn it into a product. Perhaps you want to serve your customers, you want to create a nice uh, web page for your customers, your customers are going to go in there, and then you're going to see, you're going to face some new challenges. One of the challenges is the data that you used to train your model is going to get outdated after a while. Why is that? Because you're going to have new users with new type of images, new type of text, new type of speech. One solution is to take those data, put it on top of your existing training data, and then train a new model and keep updating your model that you put in production uh, that way. That's an option, but that could happen. And this was exactly what we were doing with domain adaptation to some extent. We were doing some training, but we had some data where we didn't know what the labels were when it comes to the distribution, the shift in the distribution. But what I just mentioned is true, even for your labels. So far, we were assuming that you have only 10 classes, 1,000 classes. That could happen in total. But what happens if you have new users of your product online and those users have their own labels? They have their own images and they have their own labels. Maybe your users are using uh, different devices. So not only you can have shift in the distribution of your input data, which would be images, text, and speech, there could be shift in your labels. You could, you could end up having new labels. And that's exactly the concept of few shot learning. The idea is that uh, once you put your model in production, you trained it for 1,000 classes, but there could be five new classes that show up as part of the future interactions of your customers with your website. Now you have 1,005 classes. It means that one solution is take those data, put it on top of the data that you had previously, increase the number of classes to 1,005, retrain, and then put that model in production again. And then every once in a while, you're going to have new users, new images, new classes. Then you have to do that over and over again. This is perhaps doable, but each time you're training a model from scratch or you're training it using some transfer learning, at least the last layer of your neural network, you need to keep changing all the time. This is one challenge. The other challenge is whenever you have new data for new classes, you usually have very few of them because it is just the beginning of such images for those classes getting generated by your new users. So these are new data, you have few of them. Now you're gonna have imbalanced or unbalanced uh, number of images per class, especially the new classes. And there are also some ways of dealing with that, but perhaps we need to rethink our learning paradigm a little bit and start thinking about few shot learning. What are we doing with few shot learning? You had some new users using your website. They have some new images with some new classes. These classes you haven't seen during training. These are new breeds of dogs, for instance. And let's say you encounter four new classes when it comes to testing or when it comes to production, and each one of them has one image, two image, three image, four image. This is why it is called few shot learning. If you have one image per each new class, that's gonna be one shot learning. If you have two of them, it's gonna be two shot learning because you are given two examples for that class. It's very few examples. And then you have a new image. You don't know the corresponding label for it. This is a new user coming in your website, showing your algorithm, your model, a new image. And then your task is to label it. You need to say, you need to make some predictions. And this happens all the time in production. For instance, if there is gonna be always new products from new companies uh, on Amazon website, there's gonna be new tables, there's gonna be new 
devices, you name it. And then perhaps you want to do some sort of recommendation or you want to do some sort of putting those uh, uh, new products and then putting them in different categories. This new product, you have an image for it and you're going to put it in the category of, uh, I don't know, cell phones. And you can think of that as a classification task. So is the problem set up clear? Is the motivation clear? Okay, awesome. So what do you have when it comes to test time? You have a support set. And this is exactly this support set of new classes and new examples. Why are these classes red, orange, yellow, blue? And per each one of those, you're going to have a couple of uh, images, a handful of images, perhaps even one. These are X's, the corresponding labels, you know them. And this is a small support set of M examples in total. And what you want to do is you have a new image, let's call it X hat. You have your uh, images that you know the corresponding labels for them from your support set. There is going to be some sort of attention going on. And then the label that you're going to predict for this image is going to be a weighted combination of the labels for your for the images in your support set. So that's all you are doing. The label for this new image is an average, or it's just a summation, weighted summation of these labels. And because these are 100, ve 100 vectors, we can do your summation. One of these is going to dominate because it had the largest weight. And then you're going to report that as the corresponding class for this image, for this unlabeled image. You need to be paying a lot of attention now to the notation here because it is important and the notation is accurate. X hat is a new image, S is the support set, and then you are doing a prediction conditioned on the image that you're seeing and the support set. This is what you are doing during production time. This is unlike before when you didn't have S. So now in addition to the image, your model is taking into account the support set because otherwise you're not gonna know what are these classes. They didn't exist in your training. These are totally new classes, okay? So the notation matters. What is this A? We are used to A. This is attention. You take X hat, featureize it using a neural network. You take G and these images in your support set, vectorize them or featureize them, and then start comparing these images at the feature level. And then you are gonna put a uh, softmax on it. And this is basically saying, how similar is image, the new image, to these images, to each one of those images. And the most similar one is going to have the highest attention or attention weight. That's why the corresponding label for it wins. It's sort of like a voting mechanism, an attention mechanism. And what is this C here? How do you compare vectors? You're going to compare them using cosine similarity here. And we're going to change that in next slides. Okay, this is testing and this is during production. Is everything clear so far? Any questions? Okay, perfect. Now it's time to train this. How do you train it? The training setup should mimic what is going to happen during test time or during production time. During production time, you have a support set, you have an input image, and then you are going to predict a label. We need to mimic that for our training process. And I'm going to break this apart. But in the end of the day, what are you doing? You have X, you have S, you're writing the probability distribution on the, you're writing a model that is giving you the probability distribution and you're doing maximum likelihood estimation or minimize the negative of the log of your likelihood. And this is likelihood whenever it comes to training, it's going to be likelihood because you know the corresponding labels, you know your Ys. For these images, you're going to know your Ys when it comes to training. Okay, so far so good. But uh, why do you have so many summations here and expectations? Where are they coming from? What is B? What is L? What is your T here? Theta is clear. These are the parameters of our model. These are the parameters of these two neural networks. Let's see what they are. You have a task and your task is classification. You're gonna pick N classes from your training set. Let's say you have the entire uh, ImageNet data in front of you. For ImageNet, you have 1,000 classes. Out of those 1,000, pick four of them. Pick four classes. 
perhaps airplane, cat, dog, and fish. These are your four classes, like what you have here. You pick four classes. For each class, you're going to sample at random k examples. You're going to sample four types of different fish or four different images of uh, fish, four different images of cats, four different images of dogs, and four different images of airplanes. And this is going to give you k. And then you're going to need a batch, the same way that you were doing mini batch training of these images of x hats s is going to give you a support set b is going to give you your mini batch and your task is classification now you know this notation you pick n classes uh, from those n classes from those four classes you're going to sample a couple of examples perhaps one example per each class two examples per each class you need a batch of x hats to do your training and then you're able to write down this summation. Why is that? Because this probability distribution depended on an input image. It depended on the support set. That's why you needed these many summations and expectations. And what we, did, what we just did is n way, n in this case is four, it's four way, one shot learning task. You could have five way, two shot learning task when you have two images or three shot, okay, perfect. And uh, you do your training this way. And once the training is done, you can use that in production, the same way that we're doing any other deep learning framework, okay? And that's gonna give you, I'm gonna unravel the entire slide, and that's gonna give you some numbers here. These two numbers that you see in terms of one shot, five way, or five way, one shot classification accuracy is 41%. And you have five way, five shot, you have five examples per each class. And that's going to be the accuracy up there. If you don't do any fine tuning, you just use that in production. But during uh, production, perhaps if you're allowed to take one or two steps of gradient descent, you're allowed to do some fine tuning, then you can improve your results slightly. So these are these two numbers up until this point. But you want to beat those numbers, you are not yet happy. You want to increase them to 46% and 60% as high as possible. And that's where this other detail is going to come in. This is just a minor detail. So don't worry too much about it. At that time, they didn't know about the paper that was attention is all you need. They wanted to use attention, but to be able to use attention, you need to have some underlying recurrent neural network. You need to have some underlying LSTM architecture. And why would you need that? This architecture that you have here, this uh, plain vanilla setup, you take your image, featureize it, and then you pay attention to the features coming out of your uh, other neural network. This is one layer of attention. This is in the last layer right before your loss function. We can repeat that multiple times. You can have another layer of attention on top of this. But at that time, they didn't know that attention on its own is enough. Therefore, they were using some LSTM. And that LSTM is always looking at this image. You turn this image into a sequence. It keeps reusing this image from one step to the next step. It has its own hidden units. And then it has its own uh, cells. And then you have this attention on top of your LSTM. And we know that LSTMs are deep in time. But now you're taking time, and rather than going from left to right, you're going from bottom to top. It's just additional layers. So don't worry too much about this. This is just uh, putting more layers of attention. Same thing for G. This one is not attention-based. It is just more layers. It's going deep. This is just a minor detail. You can improve upon that using a pure attention mechanism so because attention mechanisms are going to get take as input sets and are going to output sets. Here, what you want is for this image to pay attention to a set of images. LSTMs bring some ordering in them, which you don't really need because this is just a set. Okay. So far, so good. And let's see, don't worry about this inception. This is just a very rudimentary baseline. It's ad hoc. This is one of the first papers that are introducing one-shot learning or a framework for doing one-shot learning. As you can see, if you take this uh, image, the closest one is the car here 
not any of the other images. And the other model is choosing a cat to be similar to this image. Similarly here, this is a bicycle on top of a car, but then uh, this is closer to another bicycle rather than any of the other images. And these classes are not seen during training. These are just new users, new images having their own classes. Okay, was everything clear? Any questions? Okay, perfect.